uh, I'll just start quickly with this, an exercise. Uh, and then it's a, an exercise is just a problem that um, I found was good in terms of explaining the differences between example-based testing and then property-based testing. Uh, one of the biggest problems then when you use property-based testing is deciding which strategies do you use when you try to find out the properties for your programs. Then I'll speak a little bit about TDD, uh, just, just a little bit. Um, and then what you do when you have failures, what does it mean? Uh, uh, and also uh, some more stories. So I've, I've used this before and uh, there's two examples of very good help, that, let's say, of, um, of using property-based testing to find bugs. And if you have time, then I'll, I'll speak about algebras a little bit in the end. If you look at uh, the description, let's say, on the internet of how a Swedish phone number should be, it says that it's between 13 and 16 digits. Um, it might start with plus 46 or 0046. Um, sometimes there's a, uh, just a leading zero, so it means that it was local. It was, nobody put a country code. <coughs> Then it's followed by two digits, which is a 10 or a seven, uh, a one zero, and then a seven, which is followed by uh, zero, two, three, six, and nine, and then uh, it's followed by 10, 10 digits, and the plus will be um, optional. So this is a description, like a, a, a specification of what you want to build. So usually if you would do example-based testing, um, you would start off by things like this. Like, a mobile phone number will need, um, should start with a z leading zero, and then you would TDD your way out, out of this until you finish. And uh, the thing is, uh, it's quite complicated, and so you will have to write a lot of tests, and in the beginning you would start, okay, with a zero, then you would have to add the, right, the rest of the numbers, so you'd have to change some of the previous tests and all this stuff. So uh, it might be, so it will take you a long time, and also maintaining this will, um, be costly. So we want to deliver features, we want to have this very sweet spot between um, delivering features and uh, managing risk. So we don't want to spend too much time writing test code. We want to write code that uh, actually generates value for the clients uh, or customers. Um, so here are the problems. So lots of tests, maintenance, cost of maintenance. Uh, also, it's difficult, in so many examples, you don't know exactly what is the specification, it's just diluted in, the, in all these tests. Um, and also, it only confirms your own assumptions. Like, if you forgot a test, that's it. Uh, there's a bug lying around, probably, that you didn't find. Um, so, entering uh, property-based testing, you can now uh, be a little, do a little bit better. So, um, Let's have just two tests. That's all we need. We just want two tests. It's easier to maintain, like six, eight lines of code. Um, it's also easier to specify, and I'll show you just next, how you specify the tests uh, from, the, from the description. And because of the way that you're testing, you will get uh, much better coverage. Uh, and, you know, because it's the way that this works, will actually go for the edge cases. Uh, and so it will help you out find bugs, which is not something that's uh, example-based testing. So here's a, a piece of code in, in Scala. Um, it will, uh, so ideally you, you will have this, which is, uh, it's a, it's a, there's a class, and you specify a property, which is start with a for all, which means for all Swedish numbers that you could generate, uh, you take one of those numbers, and you pass it through the validator, and it should validate. So there's a little bit of magic here of how, how do I know which of the, these Swedish numbers, you know, how, where they come from. And also uh, the second property, which is all non-Swedish numbers. So this is, there's a little bit of magic here, but this is all you need to validate. So it generates a bunch of numbers, and all those numbers get uh, validated, and it should, the ones that are Swedish, yes, they validate true, and the other ones is validate to false. That's all you need. So a lot less code. So how do you generate these things, uh, or how do you use these tests uh, in order to find out uh, how, how, do, how do you get uh, Swedish numbers? 
So if you look at the, the specification that you've, you've gotten, um, you can say, okay, plus 46 or 0046, there's about four combinations or five of things. Uh, so you, you, just, you just want to build a number, you just need one of them. So you take one of all these options. Uh, the same thing for the, for the other parts. The last bit is just uh, adds an, uh, another two combinations to the, to the first one. So you will get plus or no, for, or no plus uh, into that, uh, let's say, generator. So this is uh, easy to translate from the specification exactly into what you want to build. It's, it's very, um, let's say, traceable. So this is, this is, right, this is code. You will say, generate one of these things. So where do I put these generators? So I instantiate them like this. Uh, there's a val, so like a, a, a normal variable, and uh, I use a for comprehension. The for comprehension then uses this uh, generator uh, object, which has some methods on it. One of them is list of n, so I will, it will generate a list of and I will pass in a 10, which means that there's gonna be 10 of these things, and the, the, the thing that I'm generating is, a, is a, a, a number that is as a char. So it's a, a, a character as a, a number. So they will generate basically 10 numbers that are uh, chars. <coughs> so that will be the, the part of the number. Then you will get the prefix, which is one or zero in the, all, all the things, and then uh, you will get the country. Part. And then you put all the things together with the, with the yield part. So now you have, you have a number, um, and then you can just apply that for all, for all the numbers that get generated. You pass into the, to the property, and it will generate, uh, in this case, 100 numbers, and they will, and they will um, test if they are all, all uh, valid. So if there's anything that it's not valid, then you get an error, but uh, if your implementation is correct, then you see something like this. Um, some time, run a number of tests, all tests passed, took 10 seconds. So it's all good. So when is this applicable? So when should I use this or not? Well, in my opinion, and so far in my experience, it works very well in pure functions, so things that you pass in the arguments and uh, you get a value back. <laughs> but uh, you can also use them in impure functions. You can use uh, them in effectful things like uh, sending an email or uh, notifying some, some other service, writing to disk or logging or something like that. It does work. And also in stateful things, uh, like uh, uh, you know, if you write to a database or something like that. Um, so how do, you, how do you go about doing in, in, in these cases? So my advice is that if you have states or effects, then you might want to take them out and make them pure. So that simplifies the property-based testing thing. But if you don't, you say like, oh, I have legacy code or I don't want to do it because it's complicated or something like that, uh, or more complicated than people uh, would not understand. So maybe you can still use the normal way of doing things, which is you just uh, build your stuff or build your work, just make sure that uh, it's set up in a way that uh, it will uh, respond appropriately in all the um, 100 test cases or how many you have. Uh, but it's not a very interesting part, uh, the effectful thing. Uh, the most interesting for me, I think, it, was, it would be the stateful part, um, which, again, you can turn into a, into a pure thing. So you can use like state monads or things, things like that to, to um, uh, manage the state. But if not, then you can use something called finite state machines. <laughs> so how does that work? So imagine that you have a counter. Um, so a counter has state is how many times it was uh, being, uh, let's say, incremented or decremented, but yeah. So uh, here's the operations. So there's a reset. Uh, you start off with zero, and then you just keep incrementing one. It's, uh, normal, and then decrement, and then you get a value every now and then. So you want to make sure that this is actually correctly implemented. So you use these um, commands, kind of um, uh, 
class to, to, to be able to do this. So first you instantiate the counter, which, uh, which is the class that you want to test. And then you have a model, a representation of what, what's, the, what's the state on the other end. Because you, you, you are not able to get to the state. You need to model on your side of the testing how the, how the state is. So you, you create this case class state that holds how many times I incremented or decremented. Then, the, then you define an initial state. In this initial state, you reset the counter to zero, uh, as it was previously. So it just resets it to zero. Um, and, then, um, and then you basically take that uh, zero and put it on the current state. So that's the initial state, starts at zero uh, on both ends. Then uh, you define these properties uh, here called increment, decrement, and uh, get. Uh, and uh, whenever you, we call these properties, there's something that's going to change on both ends. So there's this methods run and, and, and next state. So when you run it, uh, in increment, you just want to increment the counter. And the next state will have, so in your state, in your uh, model of the state, you will have uh, a, the current state with plus one. So it just mirrors what's happening. Uh, between uh, the, two, the two sides of the state. So the decrement is basically the same. Uh, the get is a little bit more interesting because it has to look at the, into the post conditions of, uh, of the next state. But basically it just compares if the, what, what we've got from the get is exactly what we have on the, on the, on the state that we're in. And then the most interesting part is also these generate commands because you're, you're not generating um, or creating a generator that will take one of these uh, commands, increment, decrement, and, and get. And what this does basically is it generates a list of, co uh, of, um, of these uh, commands and it will run them into, uh, uh, randomly and it will uh, verify that at, at every point you, you, uh, the next state is, is verified. So if you increment, you will expect the two models to make, to make sense of, uh, to uh, be synchronized. So there's not much more into this. So if you put it to run, it just runs and passes all the tests, fortunately. Um, I've talked a little bit about generators because generators are the most important way, I think, or the easiest way to, to find properties. You just tweak the generators and the, the properties, they, they just come out eas more easily. So you break, the, you break your problem into small pieces and you generate exactly the right part. Um, and generators, they can be composed, so you, you, you can, there's normal basic generators for ints and strings and dates and all this stuff, uh, optionals. Uh, but also you can compose uh, generators. For example, like I use the, the list of, of n, so you can generate a list of, of, of a generator. Uh, you can also have choices, so either do this or do that. So one of, uh, was one of them. Frequency, you can say, like, generate uh, 10 of these and five of that, or 5% so, uh, of these and 10% of that. Um, you can also uh, generate product types. Uh, so, like a case class, it's a, a product of other uh, small or basic uh, um, generators, and uh, there's some types which, which is more or less like sealed traits. So these are the kind of generators that you can use. There are more, there's more. This is not uh, ex exhaustive. This is just examples of generators. You, there's arbitrary as well, which you can generate. You know, you you actually build the generator and tell him how to generate things. So the, the basic strategy, the one that you most, that it's the easiest one to go forward is, is, the, is to tweak the generators. There are other properties uh, that you can apply when you're, when tweaking, tweaking the generators is not, it does not give you any property to the thing that you want to test. So one of them is uh, transform. So you, you apply a function and it keeps the same structure of the thing but it's just transformed it in another way. Uh, for example, it could be uh, transforming something to JSON or from JSON or something like that. Uh, and you want to make sure that uh, the same 
uh, some, some of the properties might, so the number of elements is there or that every, uh, everything uh, that was there before is there afterwards, uh, just in a different uh, way. But uh, the, mo the, the, like the canonical one is just sorting. So you, you had things in, the, um, in a row, let's say, and then you just swap things. It's the same things, but just different. Um, another way is to have uh, um, functions that uh, they, they themselves are co commutative. So you can apply first one the f uh, first and then the other, or they are the opposite. So for example, if you sort, if you sort and then uh, let's say uh, sum every, every, if you have a list of numbers and you sort them and then you sum one to all these uh, numbers, it's the same as if you sum first one and then sort them. So they will be the same result. So this is another property that you, you can think of. Another thing is inverse. So you have something that, for example, puts in JSON and then gets back from JSON and you should have the original. So that's a, a, a property that is easy to, to test. Another thing is uh, item potency. So if you sort and then sort and sort, how much, many times you sort, it doesn't matter because it's already sorted, so you should see that uh, applying the function more than once doesn't change anything. Um, what other things? Uh, for example, induction. So if you, this is also good to see if something is sorted. You like test the first two and if, they, they're, if the, the, the one on the left is, uh, if it's uh, sorted uh, um, uh, incrementally. So if, um, if you see that the, the first number is smaller, then, uh, then the, the next one you know that is, it's, it's gonna be sorted, that part, so you can move to the next part and test the two numbers again. So this, this is a way of, of uh, finding out that your um, array or list is, is sorted. So it's another property that you can find. <coughs> uh, the last one is the, the one that I like the last because it was exactly what you, uh, gentleman down there was uh, alluding to, which is uh, you actually uh, write more or less another implementation for the same thing that you're testing and you're just comparing the two. Uh, it's the easiest one to find out, but uh, usually it's the less interesting one. So all, all these are different strategies. If you take this list when you're using property-based testing and you just come over here and see, oh, well, maybe, maybe this applies or that applies to this, to this, pro to this uh, part of my code, I can use this property. Uh, it's, it's good to rem remember which ones <laughs> apply. Uh, a little bit about, about TDD, so this is not uh, incompatible with TDD at all, so it's the same kind of process, not exactly the same, but similar. Uh, you just have to write your tests first anyway, um, and see them file, and then uh, the generators will probably be um, the thing that you'll have to tweak as you go along, so if you, you, you're not gonna write hundreds of tests, so you're gonna write less tests, so you have to tweak the generators. As you go along, you can tweak the generators and then tweak the implementation, for example. Uh, it's, it's harder with the other uh, strategies because uh, the strategy will be done and then you have to, uh, so it's a bigger step sometimes. But it has worked out. I, I've, in my experience, it's, it's okay. I can, still, I, I can still feel like I'm doing TDD with this. So in terms of failures, um, when, you, when it fails, you get something like this, which is, uh, it, will it will tell you which uh, property it failed, and it will give you uh, the argument that it passed, so you know exactly which, which value uh, failed. And then there is this uh, 246 shrinks just next to it as a comment. Um, this is a quite clever uh, thing that is built in into property-based testing, which is, that it tries to find the simplest value that it can find. For example, imagine that you have all these uh, increments and decrements on that counter, and it will generate, it generated thousands of, of them, and, uh, and, it, and find it, it found a bug somewhere. And uh, so you would not print thousands of increments and decrements and gets. You will just try to shrink that list as small as, as it could find, so it, that's the, the canonical, uh, let's say, list that finds that bug. 
and it gives it to you and says, I've shrunk this into this part, and this is the smallest part that I can find that finds this bug. So you can actually write it uh, in a, you know, like a normal test or just try it and see where it's filing, debug it, whatever you want to do. So this is a quite important part because it helps you out with uh, the output, let's say, of the, of the failures. <laughs> so there was, uh, the Japanese character was exactly a piece of code that was, has been working for a while and we were basically um, serializing it and then deserializing it. So to make sure that uh, on both ends of a system, when you serialize it, uh, it would then go right uh, into the, the other part and when we got there to serialize it, that we have the same piece of data. So we use this uh, uh, serializer to serializer, which is uh, very easy to think of as a, as a property. And it, 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 it ran for quite a few years until um, somehow a Japanese Unicode character happened not to have a, an inverse. So when it was serialized, when it is serialized, serialized to something different. So we, we thought about this and thought, well, we're, only not, we're not supporting Japanese characters, so we, we'll just change the generators not to include them. So this, this is one way. Another way would be, uh, yeah, so I have a bug in my code and I need to take care of this uh, Japanese character in a, with an if. So I say, if, I, if this character is in there, then the inverse of them, it's not what it comes, but it's something else. So we have to fix that. And the other one has to do with the phone numbers. Uh, so we had the, these phone numbers. There were phone numbers for quite a lot of countries and they all had their own tests around it. Uh, and then we moved to property-based testing with them, and we find loads and loads of bugs on it. Um, so, because uh, we knew that there were some bugs, but uh, they will sporadically come, like, though this, this number didn't work, and that number didn't work. Uh, but in the end, we're like, okay, let's fix this once and for all. Uh, we rewrote the tests, and we found loads of bugs. So thank you all, so I'll speak to the last slide. Thank you, Pune. Thank you.